you guys today. It sounds like you're learning a lot that is pertinent to what I do every single day, and that's uh, paying attention to how the human body works, signs that something could be wrong, and how to fix it. So. So what is your uh, job title? I am a registered nurse at Poudre Valley Hospital. I work in the perioperative department, meaning the outside areas of the operating room. So I get people ready for surgery, screen them for all their medications, health risks, problems that could be a potential. And then in the recovery room, we take care of people that are just waking up from anesthesia that have just had either a minor operation or sometimes a series of very complicated operations. Um, everything we do with vital signs and heart rate and lungs ties into how somebody is going to come out from that surgery. So your body gives you a lot of cues every single day that something might not be right. And medicine is learning how to watch for those and what to do to fix it. Do you think that there's any patterns that you find when before someone goes into operation? What are some things that you do consistently, regardless of the operation? You have to do a general physical assessment. You have to make sure that somebody's, for a elective surgery, somebody has a hernia they need to get repaired, then that's something that they can live without having done. So we need to make sure they're healthy enough to survive that operation because it's not something that they're going to die of if we don't fix it. So making sure that their lungs are working right, their heart is working right, and if it's not, how can we fix that to make that the safest thing? So making sure people that are on a bunch of different medications that we don't give them something that's going to interact with that medication because we can cause harm just as much as we can fix it. And then, so you're monitoring, you have to ask them all those questions, and you're, you're asking them, like, what medications do you take on a daily basis? Mm -hmm. um, do vitamins come into play there? They do. Okay. Vitamins and supplements are powerful substances that can affect different medications, can interact with what we're using, um, and even something as simple as ibuprofen can cause somebody to bleed too much during surgery. So we have to make, and fish oil. I'm sure you or your parents take fish oil as a supplement. That can also create bleeding. So there's things that we have to have people stop if at all possible so that we can uh, do the procedure as safely as possible. So medicines are pretty common, and many of you guys might take medicines that maybe is like a daily type of thing. And so those are the types of medicines then um, that Eric is screening for and asking about to make sure that the doctors know exactly what's in your system. Um, so that's like when we're, when we're learning about the wilderness first aid stuff, when you interact and you talk to your patient, it's really important that you also know exactly what that person has already taken throughout, throughout the day. And not only what types of medicines they've eaten or they've consumed, but also the types of foods that they've eaten as well. Because those foods can actually have different things. If someone's going in for a stomach operation and they've eaten a bunch of food that morning for breakfast, then that could definitely complicate things. Or yes, that's a, that's a big screening in the pre-op department is what did you have for breakfast to try and trick somebody into saying, oh, the breakfast burrito, that was really good. Because you're not supposed to eat for eight hours before a procedure. What, what's that reasoning for? The reasoning is when we intubate you, we put a tube into your lungs to help you breathe during the surgery. Stomach contents can come up and you breathe that into your lungs and then you get pneumonia and you could potentially die from that. People think we're just being mean, but there's a very valid reason that uh, yeah. surgery will get canceled if you uh, have breakfast, you had something to drink. You even had cream in your coffee. Oh. So pneumonia, is, is that liquid in the lungs? It can be caused, by, it's an infection of the lungs. It can be okay. liquid into the lungs can cause stomach acid, obviously, shouldn't be in the lungs. It's very toxic to those tissues. I, I don't know what time it was in the morning. My mom woke me up and made me some bacon. And it was like, uh, bef not like right when the surgery was going to mm -hmm. happen. And uh, my ear doctor, once he got out of this one surgery that he was doing, uh, he needs more hit the side that he was working on, mm -hmm. and I said I was really a hungry for bacon, and he wrote bacon on my ear. <laughs> and um, once he walks out of the room, he almost tells everyone that he, 
this kid wants bacon. There you go. So yeah. a lot of the reasoning for something like that is think about when somebody's getting ready to go into surgery. Um, if they're starting to feel really anxious about that process, then the doctors that are there and the nurses that are there, they have to still try to help you out as much as possible. So their goal is to really try to help you relax so that your vital signs don't go wild just because you're trying to, or you're, you're starting to get scared from the process. So a lot of times they might do something kind of, you know, comical like that, or where they're gonna write bacon on your ear to try to help you calm down to let, them, let you know that they are confident in their job and that they are going to take care of you and that they're gonna be nurturing you as well. Because a lot of times, you know, you go to a hospital and you might end up in a room like this where there's a bunch of wires and cords everywhere and monitors everywhere. And that can be really intimidating if you don't know what all that equipment's there to do. And it's very, it's not all hospital rooms are the most inviting places. And so the humans that are working there try to make it a nice environment so that your vital signs don't go haywire and that you don't overreact because they want to make sure that they can have a smooth surgery or a smooth operation. I use humor a lot. It's a very stressful position for anybody to be in, whether it's a minor surgery or something that they might not survive. But if you can make somebody laugh in a moment or lighten up the situation, everybody does feel better, typically. So how did you get into this job of pre-op, pre post-op type of uh, medicine? I was raised up in medicine. Both my parents were EMT and then paramedics. They ran the ambulance service up in Steamboat. Um, my father always, he wanted to go to Vietnam to be a medic, but he had broken his back so he wasn't able to serve, so he started studying through World War II, and Vietnam is really where we have gained all of our emergency medical knowledge. So he really studied that and started the ambulance service up in the steamboat. So I sat through CPR classes and first aid classes from the time I was five years up. I was the victim for all the classes. I would lay there and hold a bloody oatmeal in my mouth to puke on the little EMT students as they came through to try and save me and uh, it was always fun but it's always it sparked a passion in me and throughout my entire career I have been in some form of medicine whether that was drawing blood for the laboratory or working as an EMT or working in the emergency room but I have been in the hospital since I was 20. What was that first job that you had? As a phlebotomist, drawing blood for the laboratory. So I would be able to go to all the different departments and see all the different stuff happening and always loved the emergency room and that's where I started my nursing career. So. How many people are interested in some type of medical career possibly in the future as like a profession? Okay. Do you think that it's pretty common that phleb Lobotomist. Lobotomist. Mm -hmm. is, that an, is that a really common entry level job for uh, medical profession? It is a easy one that you can get in um, with a short amount of training. It's usually a certification of six weeks to two months. Um, some places do on the job training for that. Um, so you can, you know, start out fairly low on the token pole, but it's still a very good paying job. It's a skill that is really important. Nobody likes getting their blood drawn. I've never run into a single person that was excited about it. Don't be oh. the first, Patrick. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Sometimes when I would show blood or something up on the screen when we were learning about the insides of our human body, it yeah. became very gross to even see somebody else's. So to watch your own blood leave your arm and to feel that feeling and that type of, um, just that the, the senses that you're feeling, not only the, the feeling of it leaving your veins, but you can like see it and... <clears throat> There's a physiological response called a vasovagal response, which is why people pass out when they see blood or they get cut, is the nerve actually makes you pass out and lay down because it feels that blood is leaving and you're not going to bleed as much laying flat <laughs> without the gravity. One thing I was wondering about is uh, earlier you said that you put a tube down into the lungs. into mm -hmm. the lungs in order to allow them to breathe. How does that work? How do you get a tube into somebody's lungs? We use 
there's a tool that you put in with a blade. Right? They are not. Okay. And you can't do it on a conscious person. Okay. Conscious people should be breathing on their own. And is if there muscular responses that prevent you from being able to get the tube in your lungs if someone is awake? They are just going like, to bite. Okay. I mean, if yeah. you had somebody that was completely un un unconscious, then you can do it. But we do okay. give medications that paralyze people before we do that procedure. So they are, one, sedated completely, and then two, paralyzed so that they cannot have, that all these muscles do relax. And that allows you to open up the jaw further and you visualize through the vocal cords and it's a little, it's called an endotracheal tube. And it's got a wire that goes through that's a guide wire so it keeps it stiff because otherwise it would be floppy and you couldn't guide it correctly. So as you guide it in through the vocal cords down into the lungs and then you inflate a little balloon that keeps it in the right spot. And we always have to be very careful of getting it in the correct spot because you guys have seen pictures of the lungs and you can go down one bronchial tube and only be inflating one lung. So you always have to make sure that placement is correct. And you always have to make sure it's not in the esophagus because what would happen if it went into the esophagus? They may blow up the stomach with air. Then they puke on you almost every time. <laughs> so is that why when giving CPR, I've heard in classes that I've taken that people mm -hmm. generally throw up, is that because air is going down the esophagus, esophagus and then it's... A lot of times you're stomach. inflating that and you're just doing pressure, you know, through okay. the chest and the stomach cavity. So, and all those muscles are relaxed. Okay. That would normally, the sphincters that would normally keep everything in the stomach. When you're doing CPR on somebody, they're dead. So all those muscles are relaxed. So there's more opportunity for stuff to come up. But a lot of times it's because you're not getting all air from a mouth to mouth or a bag into the lungs or okay. some into the stomach. Makes sense. So could you take us into your laboratory here? This is one of our post anesthesia care unit recovery bays. This is Bay 5. I like Bay 5. Nothing bad has happened in Bay 5. Suction <laughs> containers. We are a critical care unit. Um, all of the nurses that work in these units have ICU or ER background. Um, we have all of the top certifications for advanced cardiac life support, pediatric advanced life support. Um, we can do everything up to innovating people if the doctor wasn't around. Luckily, we have 30 different anesthesiologists available to us, so they can do that. Do you guys, um, do you guys know what ICU stands for? Intensive care unit. So that's where the really sick people go. Um, really sick. We only have, when we're taking care of patients, we'll only have a max of two patients because everybody is high risk in this department, whether it was a finger surgery or a heart surgery. Um, so we have tools available. Suction is very important because people throw up after surgery a lot and you need to make sure that doesn't go down into their lungs. So it's um, like a vacuum? Basically. It's a vacuum. Yeah. Okay. So it's got different tubes. We have all of our gloves and hand sanitizer. Washing your hands is the best way to protect everybody from germs, whether that's in a hospital setting or here. Can you just tell us real quick, how do they teach you to wash your hands? Is there, isn't there like a specific way that they tell you, you how to wash? Well, you've got to wash for a minimum of 20 seconds. You're doing all surfaces and then you work up towards your wrists. Getting underneath your fingernails, drying before you touch the handles of the sink. You want to dry your hands and you dry away from your hands so that you're not wiping this dirty stuff from your wrist right back down onto your hands. Um, so the time and the friction is one of the most important things that you can do. Um, and then you use your paper towel and then you turn off the sink handle. You don't touch the dirty sink handle with your clean hands. You don't touch the door going out of the bathroom with your clean hands or anything else going to that. And then we always wear gloves. Gloves are as much, are more to protect us than they are to protect the patients. Some of the germs we can have are in our hands, but those other services are still going to have that. But we don't want the diseases that our patients have, and there's a lot of things that you can get from body fluids and blood. Um, so all of that is important to protect us and to protect the patients. We
we have this thing that's called a bear hugger. It's like a fancy reverse vacuum. It's a, a well, it's a blow dryer. It blows out hot air because people get really cold during the surgery. So you have to warm them back up. If you're really cold, you bleed more. So you can't, you have to maintain somebody's body temperature for homeostasis. Have you guys heard homeostasis in all your different yep. science classes? The balance. Yep. Yeah. Keep that. But as you see, we just separated by curtains, which it's not like a hospital room where the nurses that are taking care of you, when it's not such a critical situation upstairs where you can have your own room and you can have some privacy. The only privacy you're going to get in the recovery room is when we pull the curtains. Most of the time people are asleep and they're not really paying attention to what else is going on around them. But we need to be able to access each patient very, very quickly if something goes wrong. Uh, so I remember waking up from surgery and they were having that thing like blowing on me. I thought I was in like the, at the beach. Um, and I was like, oh, lovely. thank you so much. You I want me it. To that and the warm blankets are the best thing that I do in my day for everybody. Everybody's like, oh, the warm blankets are so great. And the EKG, the heart rhythm, is the other thing. Not just the rate, you've got to know that the rhythm is correct, that the electricity is traveling through the heart in the correct timing, the correct way that it's regular. Um, 54, normal adult heart rate is between 60 and 100. That's what they call a, re a regular. Yeah, this is somebody sleeping. Healthier people have lower heart rates. Marathon runners will come in and my alarms are going off constantly because it's beeping at 40 the whole time and the heart monitor thinks they're sick when they're actually healthier than most. Oh yeah, the white one is respiratory rate. So you can have something like that that's got some really wiggly beat or a tap on their finger or something like that. So you have to use your eyes and not just your monitor. We have to look at a patient and say, do they look like their saturation is 50%? Is their color okay? Are they, are their lips blue? You know, does, there's a bunch of different things that happen that your body can show you. Half of, mm, I would say 80% of my assessment is what I see in a person and how they look and are they breathing okay? Are they re breathing regularly? Is their color good? Are they alert? Or are they so sedated or so out of it that 50% makes sense if their oxygen saturation was low? So we use these as tools as well as our brain and our experience and our knowledge. So one thing that's really important in the medical field is that not only are we use, using these uh, types of measurement tools, and the pulse ox is exactly like this screen here, it just doesn't have the waveforms on these tools that we've used. So they have more technical tools, but they still have to use those um, observations of seeing somebody and being able to be a human and look at that other human and be like, wow, that person's lips are blue. That's not normal. And that's not lipstick. So therefore, we got to somehow figure out what's wrong with that person and help we them out. We were just discussing blue lipstick the other day that oh. creeps me out because it automatically cues me to somebody oh. being sick. <laughs> like, <laughs> not that's fond funny. of this style. All right, so I brought an AED. Do you guys know what that is? Automated external defibrillator. They're all over schools. They're all in the grocery store. They're in the airports. This is really important because this ties into our heart rates and it also ties into our health and being able to save somebody's life. So yeah, you wanna tell us about how these things relate? These are, have been placed over the last, oh, I don't know, it's been about 15 years for AEDs starting to come out. The only thing that'll fix a heart that is in fibrillation, ventricular fibrillation, which is this, is electricity. You have to shock it. Do you guys know how the heart communicates? Did you talk about the electricity and yeah, how yeah. it guides from the atria, the top chambers of the heart? Yeah. They fire, the electricity goes down to the ventricles, and they fire, and it has to be, it's like a concert. It has to be perfectly organized. The conductor has to be there telling it when to do its electricity, or 
you get these funny looking little beats like that one. And this is called a normal sinus rhythm. This is what you guys have seen in all the movies and what the pictures. So this is the electricity of the atria firing. This is the ventricle firing. And this is the repolarization, the charging back up of both of those things to be able to do it again. And it does it 60 to 100 times a minute for your entire life. So when someone's when All they on say when they say someone's flatlined, that means then is that correct? That flatline that is the asystole. That is no elect electrical activity, and you will not fix it with that. The only thing that you can fix is the ventricular fibrillation. When the disorganized rhythm, the atria are up here talking, and the ventricles are firing on their own and it's disorganized and therefore the pump cannot work. You cannot pump blood if it's doing this. It's got to do to be able to get that flow to go out to your vessels. When it's doing this, that's happening. This is the, you see the total disorganization that there is no organized electrical firing of the heart. So nothing's going to work. That person is going to be unconscious technically dead, but there's still electrical function that you can do something with. And what the defibrillator does is it shocks it, stops the heart, and lets those pacemakers pick up on their own. So that's all you're doing when you're defibrillating is you are stopping the heart and letting it reorganize, if it can, reorganize into a regular rhythm. So when they say flatline, shock them! <laughs> you got to do CPR. You got to beat for that heart and do the CPR and pump the blood around so that the brain can stay alive with that oxygen. So with the AED, these guys are set up to talk you through CPR, how to apply the pads, and it will read the rhythm instead of having a doctor or a nurse there to tell you whether you're in ventricular fibrillation. That machine will do it for you. This thing is designed to walk you through, like Erica said, step by step. So these pads come, all of them, these are very similar to what we have in the hospital for our fancy defibrillators. And it tells you that it wants one pad here, and it wants the other pad here. Why do you think that would be? If the electricity is going to go through those two spots. Right across the heart. Not the way you do it. The other pad. Yep. This way. Yep. Put it over here, you're going to shock their liver and they're not going to end well. The reason that this is so important to show you guys is because um, like Erica was saying, that these are now placed in a lot of locations, and we do have one here in our school. So if something were to ever happen, um, you know, hopefully that we would never have to use this skill, but it's really important that you guys do know how to do this because you guys are completely capable of using this skill mm -hmm. to save somebody's life. And this thing is designed to really walk you through it step by step. And that's why it's like constantly just talking because we're not doing anything yet. And it right. knows that we're not doing anything yet. So it's trying to say, hey, do this, do this, do this, do this so that we can save this person's life. Because if we just sit here and we look at this and we like read a manual for a while, mm -hmm. then this person could die in that time. So it's actually me to talk to you. Module. Remove clothing from person's chest. And you gotta be bare skin. You can't be part over a bra. You can't Attach be over a t-shirt. That shirt is coming off. It's the only way to do it. So so this, well, yeah, and these have to connect to the skin to transfer the electricity. You can see the pads have the speakers on. Everyone stand clear. You don't want to be touching it because it might read your rhythm. Shock advised. Charging. Really good. This person Everyone can be saved clear. if the shock is advised. Charging. Everyone stand clear. And you make sure Push nobody's touching button. it. Not an elbow, not a finger. Everybody, when we say it in the hospital, we're saying, Push the shock I'm button. clear, you're clear, everybody's clear, and you look Push and make sure nobody's touching because it will go through Push your the patient. Shock, button. shock delivered. Begin five cycles of CPR. And it's got a metronome that tells you how fast you should be pushing on that person's chest. They've come out that you don't have to do breaths anymore. 
for people that are not in the hospital or don't have a way to breathe for the patients, that just doing good, fast CPR is enough to keep the brain alive while you're getting to the hospital. So some two things I want to point out is that first off, is that you don't touch the patient because as me, I'm alive. I'm trying to save this patient. If I'm touching them, then this can actually read the electricity from my body and it can actually think that this person is still alive because it might be reading my own heartbeat. So that's why it says step away, don't touch the patient, and it reads the heart rate. It actually gains information from these pads to figure out whether or not that you can actually put electricity into the person. If they're already healthy and their heart rate's going fine and you just accident, you, this person just passed out, and it's not their heart that's a problem, it won't, it will tell you not to, yeah. it won't shock it. It will not let you it shock let anything you except for ventricular fibrillation, which is that oh. main rhythm that we can fix with oh, electricity. Sure. So it's a very smart device. And the second thing I want to point out is that there's no electricity that's sent to the pads until you, as the person doing it, pushes that green button. There's no electricity. So you're there trying to help the person and it won't happen until you actually push the button. And it will tell you to push the button at that time. So you don't need to be afraid of the, the pads shocking you. You don't need to be worried about there being some extra electricity or anything. This is a very smart device and it will only actually apply the shock if that is required. And it can read the person's heart rate. It can tell you whether or not that shock is required. All right, let's thank Erica for being here today and sharing this information with us. Thank you, Erica!